um, who is going to be talking to us about um, the uh, project in general uh, and the progress to date. And it's a very nice shirt, Jamie. It's good to see you. So I'll hand the the, um, the microphone over now to Jamie and Michael Phillips in the UK. Good morning, uh, Jamie. Um, over to you. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. And I'm going to give you a quick canter through uh, Seabed 2030, a quick overview, some progress of where what we've achieved in the last year or so since we last met. And I'll take any questions at the end or in the chat. Um, but great to see everybody online and really delighted to be here despite the time of day for in the UK. Um, so, just a reminder, we have one planet, we have one ocean, and the Seabed 2030 vision has not changed since Seabed 2030 was born, and our mission is to inspire 100% mapping of our ocean floor by the year 2030 and to make that information publicly available through the JEBCO grid. Um, I think I'm preaching to the converted here. I don't need to tell you why we need a comprehensive map of our ocean floor. Uh, it's climate change, it's the effect on ocean currents, it's the effect on uh, polar melting and sea level rise, tsunami modeling, biodiversity monitoring and protection, and of course, how to monitor and mitigate the transportation of pollutants and a whole host of other activities in that ocean space. Just a few up there. And of course, um, we all know that part of the Seabed 2030 mission is in support of sustainable UN Sustainable Development Goal 14. And we are an ocean decadal program. And I just put up here the decade challenges of which seabed bathymetry is a golden thread that weaves its way through all those challenges. There is a bathymetric component, a fundamental base layer in all those challenges and all those outcomes. I'm not going to labour this point too much, but we, we have humankind has been gathering bathymetry from time immemorial since we first started to go to sea and We've got better at it, we've got smarter at it, and we're using much more modern equipment than when we first started out with lead line surveys. But I will say, having been at sea many years ago and surveyed with modern surveying systems, areas that have previously been surveyed by lead line, some of that original information was pretty accurate. Um, you will hear much more about JEBCO, the General Bathymetric Chart of the Ocean, in a later presentation. But needless to say, when you hear about Seabed 2030, Seabed 2030 is like the air you breathe. A key component of that air is oxygen, and JEBCO is the oxygen. We don't always mention it. It's in the name, but it is there, and it, it is part of, our, of what we do and how we go about our business. JEBCO was established in 1903 by Prince Albert of Monaco. I won't say any more because more about that later. But I will put up the JEBCO mission. And the JEBCO mission is to provide authoritative, publicly available bathymetric data sets of the world's oceans. And therefore, Seabed 2030 is an accelerator to fast track JEBCO's mission and to deliver those comprehensive bathymetric data sets by the year 2030. And I will just jump back just to say uh, in this, this slide that JEBCO is a program and it is led by the International Hydrographic Organization based in Monaco and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO based in Paris. And that has been like that for a considerable number of years. Seabed 2030, I've already touched on this. It's a collaboration between the Nippon Foundation and JEBCO. And the key word here is to inspire ocean mapping and to ensure that we get to 100% by the end of the decade and make sure that information is publicly available in the JEBCO grid. And a little bit of a timeline there. 
first thought of in 2016, launched at the, EU, the first UN Ocean Conference in June 2017, and in June 2021, we became an endorsed programme of the Ocean Decade. And we've just had the second UN Ocean Conference, and a little bit more about that later. So how is Seabed 2030 set up? What do we do? Well, we have a series of work packages. Work package one, you won't be surprised to know, is all about data. And this year, in fact, this month, we released the Jebco grid, but subordinate um, and long existing products within that are the International Bathymetric Chart of the Arctic Ocean, and also the International Bathymetric Chart of the Southern Ocean. And you'll have seen those being released as scientific papers and announced way in advance of the formal release of the Jebco grid this month, in fact, last week. Lots of data in gestation. We are hugely reliant on donor organizations to make their data freely available. We do a lot of data mining across our centers. Uh, organizations who might have data but they don't quite know they've got it or it's not quite in the right format, we can help release that data into the Jebco grid. Progress so far, we have got to 23.4% of the world's ocean floor mapped, nearly a quarter of the ocean space, but we've still got more than three quarters of the ocean to go between now and the end of the decade. And this, this PowerPoint presentation will be made available so people can look at this in slower time. But what you see in the graphic here, uh, the blue addition, the, the blue shading is is what has been added in the last year. The gray shading in the ocean space is the existing data in the Jebco grid up to and including tw the 2021 release. Our second work package is all about system and tools. Clearly, gridding is our bread and butter and process improvements of data ingestation and gridding at the centres is key as we start handling larger and larger volumes of data. We've established um, a data upload system working alongside Consberg at Maritime, one of our MOU partners, where the Consberg systems are now configured or, or as part of a software rollout to have an upload facility so people don't need to think about or worry about having to download data onto removable hard drives and getting it to us. It can be done through the cloud. More about that if you're a Consberg operator um, in, uh, if, and if you're interested, get in touch with the centres and we can, up, or we can update you. Um, lots of work on statistics routines. It's clearly our progress is important. We need to better monitor how much we have mapped, and that is not a trivial task, and we're doing that through Amazon Web Services and Supercomputer Power based at Stockholm University. Um, we've been collaborating with Scripps Ocean Institute on improvements to our base grid to make our iterative gridding easier. Um, I won't go into that in any, more in any more detail. The University of New Hampshire, as part of their work, um, has designed a web app where you can view the Jebco grid, and that's been a contribution by them to Seabed 2030 and the Jebco community. Tech innovation. Um, we're not funded to do a lot of tech innovation, but we try and keep on top of it as much as we can. We're in the process of producing a tech strategy white paper. I've already touched on the statistics improvements across the centres. Um, and we have again been working with industry and the University of New Hampshire to help refine and demonstrate the new generation crowdsource data loggers, not quite rolled out yet, but we're hoping to get those out there. That we, We've got data loggers out already, but these are the next generation which will upload to a cloud. Um, we've established our global centre based at the National Oceanography Centre in the UK as a crowdsource bathymetry trusted node to handle crowdsource bathymetry from what we call uh, orphan data collectors, those that are not part of a bigger institution where there's an existing trusted node, and we will handle that through our global centre. We've done work with SailDrone and its Pacific Crossing, 
And we're again working with Consberg to develop a cloud based data processing package using their Blue Insight platform, which will allow us to help process the backlog of data at some of our centers by bringing in external support to, to do that through this cloud based system. Mapping activities, a huge amount of mapping, and this is really just a snapshot of some of the activities and some of the platforms, and I've done it by platform rather than by institution because a lot of those platforms have carried scientists from a wide variety of academic institutions to help uh, gather data alongside other science. Um, and you can see that they've been pretty busy across all the oceans. And we've been very lucky to have a modest amount of funding from the Nippon Foundation to pay for some mapping support where needed to put some mappers on board, uh, pressure drop in particular, uh, to help out when there's been no mapping support on board between, and in that case, it was transits between dives. Doing a lot of work to support crowdsourcing, and just to point out that, that the crowdsource bathymetry initiative is an IHO led initiative, um, largely driven by Jennifer Jenks and her team at the IHO's Data Center for Digital Bathymetry. Jennifer also being the chair of IHO's Crowdsource Bathymetry Working Group, and we work hand in glove with her and her team to manage a number of projects, crowdsource projects, where we've been able to provide some data loggers and some modest support, and that's been in South Africa, Greenland, Palau, various vessels in and around the Southwest Pacific, and some global organizations, and you might have heard of the International Seakeeper Society, that's one of those organizations. Um, we had some underspend where we managed to pump that into some satellite-derived bathymetry products to help accelerate mapping and demonstrate that as a viable data source. And you will have read, uh, and it's been announced in the media, that Figro, one, one of our collaborators right from the very start of, of, of the Seabed 2030 journey, has clocked up 2 million square miles of data donations from its transit data between client jobs. Um, I'm not going to major on this because you will hear much more about this from Kevin and the team, but the Tonga Eruption Site Mapping Project, a NIWA Nippon Foundation project, but we have been involved to a degree in helping support that. On the management side, our, our fifth work package, we've been doing work with uh, a blue economy solutions provider to look at how we might try and prioritize the ocean space in terms of needs and mapping hotspots. That, of course, is not a trivial task. The work has been going, ongoing for a couple of years now, and we're, we're have, we've had internal workshops in 2022, and we're hoping to move on to the next phase of that where we can, we can engage more closely with all the ocean stakeholders in trying to deliver a priority list. We have a growing number of MOUs and supporters. We've got about nine, uh, 29 MOUs now. The latest you might have seen was NOAA that has formally joined us by establishing an MOU with us. And that was signed last week at the UN Ocean Conference. Um, alumni engagement is, is part of our activities. Again, some modest funding to, to work with our alumni core. So these are the fellows of the University of New Hampshire course that is is run on behalf of the Nippon Foundation and JEBCO, the ocean mapping course, over 100 fellows. And we'll look at how we can try and integrate those into some of our activities. Um, and we hope to be able to use them in the SECO map, that, that cloud mapping program that I talked about earlier. We're not quite there yet, but we're looking at how we can get some funding to make that happen. Lots of media activities. Um, we produce a periodic in-depth newsletter. If you're not on the distribution for that and you'd like to see it, either check out our website or approach us and we'll put you onto our MailChimp distribution list. And, and the inquiries email address is right at the start of the PowerPoint slide and you will that, that, that this will be made available to you. Uh, over 270 media art items in the last year. 
and lots of significant articles that we've 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 submitted to various uh, technical publications. And of course, engagement out at conferences and events such as this, um, lots of activity, and this is just a snapshot of some of them here. Right at the start, and particularly at the start of the year, those were virtual attendances, but we've been able to start traveling again and doing a lot of margins work. And of course, the most recent was last week at the UN Ocean Conference, where we had a team there, sadly, Due to a positive COVID test, I was not able to attend in Lisbon, uh, but we had a strong team there and we were able to run a side event, um, which was virtual and in attendance. And if you want to catch up on that uh, and look at some of the, the experts who were talking about the importance of ocean mapping in their spheres of science, then the link is on our website and there is a, a recorded movie and you can catch up on what happened there. But that was a really great event. Um, and I think I'm running out of time now. So just to just to make the point that we still have three quarters of our ocean still to map. There is a paucity of information out there uh, as these graphics describe. And I'm going to cut short now and say thank you very much for listening. And thank you to all our centres and our partners who are supporting the Seabed 2030 mission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, that was uh, very interesting, even for me as, as a head for the, this region. Um, and it's really great to see that the project is getting a lot more traction internationally. Uh, and that's been recognised by the quality of the of the um, events that that we've been invited to, like the COP and the and the One Ocean um, Summit. So I think um, the story about you know how important the world's oceans are, and how um, lack of understanding we have of the seabed is actually getting through to um, senior policymakers and decision makers. Um, and I think that that's that's good news for us. Uh, are there any questions for Jamie? If there is, you can raise your hand or put questions into the chat. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So we'll go on to the next agenda item, um, which is for me. Uh, and I'll be talking about um, the activities and the progress that we've made within the South and West Pacific Centre for CB 2030, um, really focusing on, on the outreach we've been doing within the region um, and, and um, other activities that's happened over the last 12 months. So just as a basic introduction, um, and I'm sure everybody realises this, um, but just in case, CB 2030 is actually split into four regional data centres and each of those data centres has a responsibility for a large piece of the world's ocean. Um, so we are highlighted there in the purple on this graphic uh, representing the South and West Pacific. So we go from 10 degrees south, uh, sorry, 10 degrees north of the equator all the way down to 50 degrees south and then all the West Pacific, uh, which includes Asia as well. Um, we uh, represent 123, just over 123 million square kilometres of ocean, um, which is more than a quarter of the world's ocean. Of that uh, area, 67 million uh, lies outside national jurisdiction. So over half the half that um, area that in our centre is in um, areas beyond national jurisdiction and in, in, in the open ocean. Our centre covers 39 countries and territories. Uh, and over 80% of the sea floor within our centre is deeper than 3,000 metres. So we have the um, deepest part of the sea floor of the globe uh, covered within our centre. And these include the four deepest spots in the, in the ocean on the planet, uh, the Marianas Trench, the Tonga Trench, Philippine Trench, the Kermitic Trench, which are all over 10 kilometres deep. In terms of um, administration within the data centre, um, the South and West Pacific Data Centre is uh, hosted in New Zealand, is physically hosted at NIWA, which is the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research in Wellington. I'm the centre head uh, and I'm assisted by the centre manager, Haya Repairs, who's, who's um, moderating this call. 
but we are assisted by a technical management committee um, that is comprised of um, scientific staff from GNS Science and hydrographers from Land Information New Zealand, which is the National Hydrographic Authority within New Zealand. So in terms of our centre, we have the full expertise of um, scientists and hydrographers um, that is really greatly assisted uh, assists us in how we manage um, the centre. And then we have what's known as a regional mapping community, which is um, the data contributors. It's really you, you, the audience who are listening. You, you guys are the regional mapping community, um, and, and they're the people that really make uh, CB2030 a success because you're the guys who actually go out on the water, collect the data, and then um, share the data to um, CB2030 to assist in making the Jibco world map. This is a quite a complex um, diagram about showing the data flow, but I'll summarize uh, very quickly. Um, all the data contributors happen on the left side of the graphic, um, different sources, whether it's coming from vessels or boats or organizations or governments. The role of the regional centers highlighted there, the four regional data centers is to get all that data from all the different sources. And we compile those data into what's known as regional gridded products. So we will produce a single gridded product for the South and West Pacific. And then we forward that grid on to the global center, which is based in the UK, and they then assemble that into the global bathymetric grid. And so this uh, is um, a screenshot of the regional grid that we produced in order to generate the GEPCO 2020 grid. It's a single grid um, that, that is assembled from all the data contributions that we receive. One thing that is important to note that we we stack data sets, we don't average depth. So where there are multiple data sets, we're not averaging the depth between them. We stack the data sets based on a criteria, um, based on things like age of the, data, of the survey and the type of equipment and the resolution of the survey and, and whether it's a transit or actually a dedicated survey. So we have a whole set of rules that we build that allows us to stack data sets in a priority to ensure that at the top um, that's delivered to Jebco is the best and the most appropriate depth sounding for that cell. Just in terms of the software that we use um, in-house, um, we use uh, Chimera to do the processing. We, we receive um, a lot of data products actually as raw data files. Um, that are completely unprocessed. So we actually do a lot of work and a lot of time and effort processing those from scratch. Um, but we also do receive um, data as completely gridded products um, and, and everything in between too. So there's no limitation about what you can contribute to the data center, but if it is received as raw data files, we're using Quint, uh, Chimera as the product to generate the, uh, to clean the data and generate surfaces. And then once we've generated surfaces of all data contributions, we use a product from Esri called ArcGIS Bathymetry. Um, and that basically allows us to stack um, multiple surveys and multiple grids on top of each other and assign metadata to those grids. And then we have rules that read the metadata to assign priorities as to which data gets stacked on top of another. So that's just some in-house um, software about how we actually handle these large data sets within the survey. And I do need to um, thank uh, specifically QPS um, because they have donated licenses for Chimera, FMGT, FM Midwater and Flader Mouse to the CB2030 um, for the purposes of this data pr um, assimilation process. And if it wasn't there for their support, um, we would be struggling uh, to do this. So thank you very much to QPS. Here is um, Jamie's already showing this graphic more or less. This is the uh, latest Jebco 2022 release. So this is the latest version of the Jebco grid that was released in World Hydro Day um, a few uh, a week ago. Um, but the difference is that I've uh, we've got this now as a Pacific centric map, um, and you can quite see clearly see in the blue. The blue is areas of new bathymetry that's new to seabed uh, to. Jebco 2022, as opposed to the grey, which were um, 
data that is already being uh, assimilated into the GeoCo product. So we can actually see there's lots of blue. It's good to see lots of blue in the South and West Pacific, uh, which really um, indicates we've had a lot of a uh, lot of contributions from you all this year, and that's highly appreciative, and that really makes a difference to the numbers that are coming through. But as Jamie has said, there's lots of gaps in the Pacific. You can see large areas that uh, really have got no soundings at all. And, and a lot of these areas are actually within coastal states and around coastal um, and, uh, and, and economic zones. So it's not just the high seas that is not really being mapped. Um, there's still lots of areas of seafloor around uh, nation states too that really need to be uh, mapped. And if they have been mapped, um, kind of really need to have that data shared with JEBCO. Uh, and just for the record, that URL at the bottom, uh, if you're interested, um, all the data that we get for CBED 2030 uh, and the JEBCO products, sorry, let me rephrase that. The JEBCO products are always available at the JEBCO.net. So that's where you go to to get the latest version of the JEBCO grids. Now, if we break down the progress to date, um, Jamie's already said that uh, just over 23% of the sea floor is now mapped. Um, if we look at the histogram, looking at progress, when CB2030 started, that number was six, just over six percent. So we've gone from six percent to um, to basically quadrupled that um, over the last um, really five years, uh, which is um, huge progress. Um, if you notice at the histogram too that those numbers kind of really leveled off between 2020 and 2021 and to a large degree that really reflected uh, the effects of COVID on um, movement of survey vessels and, 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 and shipping um, and, and a lot of uh, surveys were certainly cancelled at the beginning of the pandemic um, and so a lot of those planned surveys and mapping of the seafloor hasn't really happened and that's quite clearly seen in this histogram but now that the sea the world is really opening up. We can see a big jump from last year, a um, couple of percent, uh, and those numbers are increasing. So hopefully it's going to be getting close to business as usual in the next 12 months. Um, now, you also see in this histogram that we have different color bands indicating different depth bands and cell sizes and percents. So what um, this means is this, this comes to um, a question that I get asked is, you know, what does 100% mapped mean and how does CB2030 calculate its percentage mapped? Um, and what, sorry, uh, before I go into how we do that, let's just um, go into the, the actual center itself and I'll break down those numbers. Um, 23.4% of the world's sea floor mapped. Uh, within the South and West Pacific region, that number is actually 24%, so we're actually uh, batting above average uh, in terms of our centre. And in terms of the contribution to the, the total area of the world's mapped, South and West Pacific contributes 35% um, of that um, global number. So we are, are contributing a very significant amount to the world's um, um, mapping of the JEBCO product. Right, getting back to how do we calculate that 100%. So that 100% is actually calculated on um, based on depth band. So when CB2030 was first muted, we really wanted to have an understanding about how to calculate um, a number that's meaningful. And what uh, what we do when we generate these statistics is we look at the depth bands and for each depth band we assign a cell size and within that cell to be mapped you have to be at least one real sounding or one really depth value within that cell. So the cells range from um, 100 to 100 meters cell size if it's water depth less than 1,500 meters. Um, 200 by 200 meter cell size from 3000 to 1500, 4 by 400 meters cell size by 3000 to 5750, and then for the ocean trenches, we're, we're, we're um, calculating a statistic based on an 800 by 800 meter cell size. So they that's the cell size that we use to calculate the percent coverage. In terms of outreach um, and engagement um, we've had in the last 12 months, there's the list of, of um, meetings and summits and uh, conferences that we've um, engaged with. Now, this is not an ex 
exhaustive lift that list there's been also many um conversations um directly through um video calls through other government agencies around the pacific as well so all i'm listing here are just the major conferences um that we've uh, uh, that we've been presenting at um and we've been quite a busy year and as you can see apart from um the one meeting in new zealand we've managed to, to go in person the last four months have all been online meetings um, but with um, travel opening up certainly with the new zealand travels opening up uh, we expect the next 12 months to be a lot more in-person meetings uh, going forward and in terms of the major contributors that we've received um, over the last 12 months they're listed here there's been many um, contributors and, and if you're on that list thank you very much um, it's been an amazing contribution this year uh, from around the region and that's been reflected in, in the increase in numbers that we've had um, in the percentages. Just um, another statistic to throw you, these green histograms here represent um, the, the percentage of cells within the GEBCO 2022 grid. Um, this is not the same calculation that we had for the global grid, but this is just within our grid that we submit, the regional grid we submit for we're getting close to 27% of our um, regional grid that we submit to the global region has now got a, a real sounding behind that. So that's um, a huge increase. And again, thank you very much for all the contributors this year um, that have contributed to the to the our submission to the GEPCO 2022 grid. And these are a list of the contributors um, that have already given us data. Um, these are people that have given us data since our contribution to the Global Center for the 2020 grid. So these will be included in the GEPCO 2023 grid. So thank you very much if you on that list. Uh, it's been really, really huge um, support and it's really good to see so many new data sets arriving already uh, for next year's delivery. Now, Jamie's already mentioned um, CB2030's involvement with the IHO crowdsourced bathymetry. Um, project um, CB2030 does uh, fund data loggers we, we we pay for data loggers and we'll distribute them out to anyone who wants them and here's some examples of some work that we've been done in the southwest pacific over the last 12 months um, our data loggers that we've received from CB2030 we've distributed to a variety of boats some outstanding mentions is from the um, MY Dapple which is a, one, a super yacht that, that cruises around the South Pacific Ocean. Uh, and we've got loggers installed not only in the main vessel itself, but also on its um, work boats and, and um, other, other vessels it launches. And they've been operating since uh, October 2021, um, collecting a, um, a great deal of um, single beam data through the data loggers. We also have data loggers installed on NIWA's fleet of um, small inshore work boats. Um, and we've just sent some data loggers to be installed on New Zealand's Department of Conservation work boats as well. And we're currently in discussion with the New Zealand Coast Guard um, for the installation of data loggers uh, on their fleet of vessels as well. And just uh, a finish off on, um, on, on a, an introduction about how to contribute to uh, CB2030. Um, how to contribute can be found on the CB2030 webpage as well as on the Jebco webpage. Both links will take you to the same site. Uh, and when you click on the how to contribute site or contribute data site, you'll get led to a little form that lets you fill an email address and contact details and just some simple questions asking about the nature of the data um, you wish to contribute or any other queries. Um, there is the contribute data on the on the uh, CB2030 page. And um, that's it. That that um, concludes my uh, discussion about um, activities for the region. Are there any questions from anybody? Right, I'm not seeing anything, and I see the polls already come out. Have you downloaded data from last year? That's very interesting. 50%, uh, wow, that's a very interesting poll actually. Um, and again, uh, one thing we have had, and we'll talk about this later, is we the center has run a webinar series just recently. Um, and one of the things that we um, asked people to do as sort of a homework exercise is to get on the GEPCO website and, and just try and experiment with downloading data for their part of the world. 
um, as a two two process um, thing that we're looking at here in terms of we're trying to find out how easy it is uh, for you to download data, but also it's a question of trying to get people to actually look at the seabed um, that Jebco shows around their part of the world and and see if there's any glaring obvious omissions in terms of data sets or if there are any glaring um, errors in the seafloor that Jebco publishes. And, and we really ask that um, everybody um, just flick us an email if you haven't any, seen any issues because we can address them and, and we can't really fix issues or address issues if we don't know about it. Right, so if there's no further questions, um, I think we'll move on to the next presentation. Actually, um, hi, we've got a new poll question too. Yes, if we want to ask about um, if there's a set up a poll, if you could say whereabouts uh, you are listening in from, um, there'll be a poll going up about that. So if you just um, see the poll, whereabouts you're listening in from, just answer that question. There you go. People have already asked nine responses. Just uh, when you can, just enter your response uh, and it'd be really interesting to see where people are uh, phoning in from. So we'll move on to the next presentation now from Haruka Ogawa from the um, uh, Japanese um, Coast Guard. Um, uh, Haruka, are you ready to present? So we do have Haruka as a, a recording. So I'm going oh, to she's a video. That's great. Play it. Yes. Okay, so if you can play that now, please. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Haruka Ogawa, Hydrographic and Oceanographic Department, Japan Coast Guard. Today, I would like to talk about effort for Seabed 2030 of JHOD. These are today's contents. First, I will talk about latest information about our organization. Second, joint research with JAMSTEC. Then, new bathymetric data on the Japanese Antarctic Research Expedition. And, Finally, talk about data compilation for the new data set around Japan. First of all, our fundamental mission is to collect and disseminate information for the safety of navigation and the conservation of marine environment. Our missions have increased in various fields where the expertise of JHOD can be applied to, responding increasing demands to the sea. As latest information about JHOD, in addition to the large five survey vessels already in place, two of the largest survey vessels ever operated in our organization. We will use these vessels to conduct our hydrographic and oceanographic research for the uses described in the previous slide. Let me continue on to my second topic. We executed a joint research agreement with JAMSTEC at 25th March. The objective of this research is to establish the arts of sophisticated technology for processing graded bathymetric data by super resolution method using machine learning. We will develop the advanced technology and conduct academic activity through exchanging data and technology with each other. Now, I'd like to explain the third topic. Japanese Antarctic Research Expedition Depth Data was released. It is available to add it to SAPAC dataset. You can download from this URL. The Japan Coast Guard conducts bathymetric survey and tidal observations around Showa Station in Antarctica in order to obtain Bathymetric data for charting purposes. As you know, nautical charts are necessary for ensuring the safety of ship navigation, so that is the framework of the International Hydrographic Organization, Hydrographic Commission for Antarctica. Each member country have responsible for hydrographic survey and chart publication in its assigned area. This is a part of the downloaded data. From this bathymetry, we can see the geological continental edge. And 
I will show you another bathymetric data. This is a glacial skull. Let's move on to talk about data compilation for the new data set around Japan. We are in the process of making a new data set for contribution to CBET 2030. Compared to current uh, data set around Japan for JBCO 2014, resolution and accuracy of gridded bathymetry will be better. In this slide, I want to explain differences in data compression method between current dataset and the new dataset. First, standardization of grid data creating method. We usually have transferred every two or three years, so the same person does not always generate a dataset. Therefore, this is important for us. Second, we updated the data source to generate new grid data. For example, we imported JAMstack data that had not been previously imported. Also, we replaced the old data with new data. Third, we again removed spike data from all data sources. Fourth, we also used Q for the, some data processing uh, to improve processing efficiency. Addition to that, we'll consider utilizing the de developing results of joint research with JAMstack. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please send email to me. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Haruka. So, Haruka, um, that was a pre-recorded uh, message. So, if you do have any questions for her, um, we have her um, email address that we can share with you. So, I think the best thing to do if you have questions for Haruka is to um, contact us and we can pass them on to her. So, given um, that there's no questions, uh, I think we'd like to move on to the next agenda item. Uh, which is from Dr. Brooke Tozer from GNS Science, uh, who will be talking to us about the SRTM 15 plus um, model. So over to you, Brooke. OK, can you see the slides? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, um, hello, every hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Brooke Tozer, and so I'm going to be talking about the SRTM Plus project, which I've been involved with over the past few years. And I'm sure most of you are aware um, that we provide the satellite-derived predicted depths that we generate for this product to be used as the base layer for the GPCO grid um, to fill in cells where there is no other higher resolution um, data available. And so just as a quick outline of what I'll, what I'll cover today, um, so for those of you who were at this meeting last year, you may recall that I gave a, a talk that sort of detailed how the predictive bathymetry is derived. And so I won't repeat that today, um, but I know those talks are posted on their uh, YouTube channel, so you can go and check that out there if you're interested. So instead, I thought I would give a brief overview of the project history to give you a feel for it, um, quickly talk about the current resolution of predictive bathymetry, and then where this project is going in the future. Um, I then thought it might be useful to take a look at um, some of the related products that have come out of the Topix lab recently um, that you might not be aware of and where you can go to, um, to get your hands on those. And then finally, I just want to highlight this um, case study from a few months ago where we had some colleagues reach out to us um, looking to track down a potential site for mooring a wave buoy in the Southern Ocean, sort of as a case study for using these grids for targeted transit mapping. OK, so the SRTM Plus project aims to provide a global elevation grid um, by combining onshore digital elevation models, offshore uh, shipboard derived bathymetry and satellite derived bathymetry um, based on altimetry measurements um, and using the marine uh, gravity anomaly to derive these depths. And so we aim to provide an elevation value for every grid cell globally. And so the main contribution we make in terms of data input into this grid is the creation of these predicted bathymetric depths. Um, and like I said, this is done using the marine gravity anomaly derived from satellite altimetry to make estimates of the bathymetry. And so I'm quickly just going to run through the major milestones of the project. Um, so starting in the mid 1990s, um, following the declassification of the geoset altimetry data, 
um, David and Walter Smith uh, published a series of sort of breakthrough papers on these topics. And so these included the derivation of the first global marine gravity grid, um, a regional predicted bathymetry grid um, that sort of focused on the processing recipe for, um, for producing these depths. And so that processing recipe is still pretty similar to what we use today. And then finally, in 19, uh, 1997, in the science paper, um, they published the first global predicted bathymetry grid. And so at this stage, the grid had a, um, a spatial sampling rate of two arc minutes, and the predicted bathymetry had a spatial resolution on the order of about 12 kilometers. And so this has been updated periodically um, as more shipboard and altimetry data has become available throughout the decades. And so the next major um, the next major release was uh, was in the late two uh, late two thousands when J J Becker, a PhD student of David's, um, spent a lot of time adding in new shipboard data to the database and importantly cleaning out and editing a lot of bad ship data, particularly with single beam soundings that were causing a lot of um, artifacts and spurious uh, depths in the grid up till this point. Um, and that's something we still have issues with now and have to deal with. Um, every time we, we do a new update. And so he also reduced the um, the grid cell size to 30 arc seconds to better reflect the high resolution product where shipboard data does exist. And he added in the shuttle radar topography mission onto elevations, and that's where the name of the product is derived from. So SRTM with the plus representing the addition of bathymetry. And so then in 2014, a lot of other new onshore DEMs had become available. So Chris Olson worked with David to process and combine these and replace the land data from the previous version. And at this point, they also decided to increase the sampling rate to 15 arc seconds to provide a high resolution product for this new land data, but also where multi-beam exists in the oceans. So um, at 15 arc seconds, we have pixels of about 500 by 500 meters at the equator. And so then I joined the Topex lab as a postdoc in 2018, and at this stage, several more years of new altimetry data had been acquired, and in particular, uh, new data from these two altimeters, Altica and Cryosat, were really important. So Altica was the first altimeter um, to use the KA band, um, which provided uh, much more precise measurements, and we were able to de derive a much more accurate um, gravity anomaly map, um, which maps into better predicted bathymetry. And then Cryosat 2 is really important because it fills in the very high and low latitudes where we didn't have much data um, prior to this mission. And so we processed and combined these data and produced the latest version of the grid, which is this SRTM 15 plus version 2.0. Um, and the current release, we're actually up to 2.4 now, and so you can you can get your hands on this at this website, and I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about that in the coming slides. Um, but this just contains several more years of altimetry data since we published the 2019 paper, as these satellites have been orbiting the globe and continuously collecting uh, new measurements. And around 2,000 new multi-beam cruisers are in there since um, since the release of the 2019 version. And so um, in this grid, we currently have 11.3% of the oceans constrained by shipboard measurements with the remaining coming from this prediction method. So you can see we're kind of lagging behind the GEPCO community now in terms of how much um, ship data is going into this product. Um, and so, like I said, we provide the predictive bathymetry to be used as the background um, for the GEPCO grid. So, so now I just want to quickly touch on a comparison between the predicted bathymetry and high resolution multi beam. And so this is a map showing a region offshore Chile heading towards the Chilean trench. And so we can see in the predicted bathymetry here as we move uh, from west to east towards the trench, we have this sort of broad deepening into the trench. And then you can make out these two large seamounts here. So this one and a more elliptical one up here. And so now if we overlay the high resolution multi beam, you know, you can see it's really like putting your glasses on and all of a sudden we go from this low resolution picture to being able to see all of this fine detail. And so all of these small seamounts here are just too small um, so that are below the detection level of the um, prediction method. And also you can make out these um, bent fold scarps here that are related to the subduction process. And so what I'm really trying to highlight here is that the predicted bathymetry is still very far off the target resolution of the seabed 2030 goal. So we're sort of on the order of about six to eight kilometers in terms of spatial resolution. So it's a lot, it's a lot, um, a lot worse than the target sort of 400 to 800 meters that Kevin was talking about earlier. Um, but in saying that, there is still a lot of room for improvement here. And so on that note, I just want to highlight what's coming in um, future years for predicted bathymetry. And so later this year, NASA is due to launch the SWAT altimeter. Um, and this is really exciting because it will use a new technology where the data is not only, be uh, not only being collected along the single NIDAR pointing track, but being collected as these large swaths. And so this should provide global coverage every 22 days, which will substantially increase the volume of data available for recovering the gravity 
field. And so we anticipate we might see about a factor of five increase in the accuracy of the gravity field that can be produced, and that maps directly into better predicted bathymetry. And so with, we might see perhaps a, a twofold increase in the spatial resolution. So really it's just sort of fingers and toes crossed that the launch and deployment of this goes um, all as planned and really sort of just watch the space for updates coming in sort of late 2023 and beyond. Um, so now I just want to demonstrate where the best places to go to get a copy of the grids that are produced from the Topex lab. Um, so you can visit the, the lab web page here, which will land you at this um, homepage and then navigate to the various um, different projects um, through that. Or, or more, sort of more simply, you can tack on slash pub to this URL and this will land you at this public facing FTP site. And so this contains this directory structure here and then each of the projects has a, has a separate directory where you can access the latest version of the grids, older version of the grids and, and um, a little bit of metadata and some readmes and things. And so you can see here we have the SRTM 15 plus directory. Um, you would go here if you wanted to get your hands on the global marine gravity grid and vertical gravity gradient. And then uh, this directory here contains the synthetic bathymetry grid or SYNBATH, uh, which I'll talk about in the next few slides. And so we don't have time to go into this now, but I just wanted to make everyone here aware that this grid now exists and um, recommend this paper if you want to learn more about it. And so basically, um, what we're looking at in this figure is the existing SRTM, um, SRTM grid across the Indian Ocean triple junction. And so we can see this uh, background predicted bathymetry, low resolution predicted bathymetry, some uh, single beam uh, transects running through it and some multi-beam swaths. And then near the rejects here, we have some nice um, multi-beam with this sort of characteristic abyssal hill fabric. And so what this new product does is it, can, it, it sort of combines some statistics from the existing multi-beam, uh, the gravity data, plate spreading rates and directions and sediment thickness maps, and then comes up with synthetic estimations of higher resolution seafloor to fill in the predicted bathymetry. And so this is what that looks like. And so now obviously there's a potential problem here and that in isolation, if you showed this figure to someone, they might get the impression that all, all of the gaps have been mapped. And so it's important to keep in mind here that this bathymetry isn't real. And so this table is published with the grid to warn against potential pitfalls of where this data shouldn't be used. And so this is things like navigation and law of the sea. But in terms of a usage case that I think is really relevant to this group and the CB2030 goal is this one. And that's sort of um, to do with uh, being able to show people sort of quickly and people who maybe aren't used to looking at the seafloor about what we're trying to achieve here. So I think it makes for quite a powerful comparison if you can say, hey, this is what we currently have with this blurred low resolution background predicted bathymetry. And this is what the seafloor might look like if we we're able to map it in its entirety with ships. And I think you, you, you quickly get a sense of what we're missing. And then you also get a different impression as to what the large scale ocean floor actually looks like. Um, and so the other big change in this grid compared with SRTM is what's done with the C mounts. And so these are replaced with a more sophisticated modeling strategy. And again, I don't have time to go into this, but in, um, in the Samwell paper and also this paper, um, that's described in more detail. Um, and so this is what some C mounts look like in the Southern Ocean here in the existing SRTM grid. And this is what they look like with the synthetic model. And so you can see they sort of now have this idealized Gaussian shape, um, but you can see the benefit in doing this when you look at this figure here. So what we're looking at now is um, measured, uh, the measured depth to the top of seamounts using multi-beam data versus those predicted in the SRT model here on the left, and then the same for the synthetic model on the right. And we can see the mismatch between the two uh, decreases from around, uh, well, greater than 500 meters to around 50 meters. And we also remove this negative bias that exists um, when we use the predicted bathymetry method. And so finally, I just want to um, highlight this case study, this case study from earlier in the year where we use this grid, where we, where we use these grids. Um, so some colleagues reached out to GNS and they were on the hunt for a location to moor, uh, to moor a wave buoy in the Southern Ocean, um, and they required a depth of less than 200 meters. And so um, they had looked at this old NOAA chart and found a seamount that potentially uh, was around 200 meters depth. Um, and so they sent this through to Vaughan Stagpole and he investigated and found that this had come from a single beam line shot in the early 1970s. And so at that point he had um, pretty low confidence as to whether this actually existed given, given some of the large areas we know exist with some of this old single beam data. And so he sort of swung his head around the corner into my office and asked me about what the SRTM grid showed um, in this region. And so this is that same seamount in the predicted bathymetry grid. And so um, 
first of all, you know, there is a seam out there, so that's promising, but we thought we'd investigate the other grids and, and see what they showed. And so first we took a look at the vertical gravity gradient. And so this showed these um, nice high amplitude anomalies here, which are indicative of um, shallow large seamounts. Um, so that was promising. And then in the synthetic bathymetry grid, um, this seamount here had a minimum um, predicted depth of around 215 meters. So we thought, you know, this could be worth a shot. Um, if you map the seamount, you might find that um, the peak that the that the top of the seamount is um, around or or um, less than 200 meters, and so a call was sent out to some colleagues who were known to be sailing south in the summer season in the RV Laura Bassey and RV Aaron, and um, they were asked, you know, if you're in the vicinity, if um, there's a chance you could do some transit mapping across this. Um, it turns out both of these vessels were able to do that, and so this is just some raw data from the RV Laura Bassey, and it was found, you know, indeed these seamounts do exist, so that's great, um, and a minimum depth of around 220 meters was found, and so maybe it might be slightly too deep for the mooring application, but I think this kind of just highlights how collectively these grids can um, be helpful in identifying and giving confidence um, to promote transit mapping in instances where you know, um, the data has sort of an immediate use case. Um, so that's something to think about to keep in mind when you're planning transits to take a look at these grids um, and see if there's interesting things that um, maybe you could map along the way. Um, so in terms of key takeaways, uh, the main one being to, to visit this website um, to get the latest copy of these grids. Um, and I think I might just leave it there in the interest of timekeeping. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Brooke. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, what, a, what a great presentation. And I can't wait for those new um, satellites to be launched. I'm really looking forward to the to the uh, high resolution products coming out. Um, do we have any questions for Brooke? So just um, very quickly, and I know I've already talked to you about this already, Brooke, um, but we had we did have a question about coastlines and about coastlines and the products. Um, and about some issues, especially in the Jibco grid um, that's using SRTM close to the coastlines and some artifacts. Can you just give a little talk about how SRTM um, identifies where the coastline is and, and, and the issues there are? Yeah, so the, the coastline actually comes from um, the generic mapping tools, GMT coastline, which has a specific name that uh, eludes me right now. Um, but that's that is not that coastline database is known to have to have issues. And I, I guess the thing to keep in mind is that the the grid cell size of 15 arc seconds is such that um, the coastline is never going to be very accurate. Um, I think the the key takeaway, the key thing I would say is if you're interested in in having a high resolution coast, you really be, need to be looking at a, a local product and a much at a much higher resolution. Um, so if yeah, if you, if you have an application where you need a detailed coast, this this probably isn't the product for you, I would say. Yeah, All right. Thanks, Brooke. Um, I don't see any other questions, so thank you very much, Brooke, and we'll move on to the next um, agenda item, which is from Dr. Jeffrey Lamarche, um, who is on the Jibco Guiding Committee, and he's going to give a presentation about uh, Jibco. So over to you, Jeffrey, if you're ready. Yeah, I'm uh, ready. I'm supposed to be ready. I need to share my screen. My sharing screen. This one. Can you see it? Hello? Ah, yes, yes, we can. <laughs> right. OK, so why are you laughing? It's not a good start. Oh, because everyone. you've, got the, you've uh, got the world white right around. I love it. Yeah, I mean, it's the world that other way. Um, anyway, thanks for noticing. OK, kia ora everyone. My name is Joe Folamarsh. I'm the um, I'm part of I'm presenting here, I think, as part of the guiding um, Jibco guiding committee. But uh, I, I, I know quite a few of those people that I was looking through the talks and um, at the audience, and it's, it's really great to see all those people that, and all those friends and colleagues from the my previous life when I was at NIWA a few years back. Um, so uh, so, so talk up to now have been absolutely fantastic and actually a bit probably a reflection of people who are paid to do their job. And when you are on the guiding committee, it's, uh, it's uh, an evening and a weekend type of jobs. And it's, uh, it's not an excuse, but it's maybe a, an explanation rather of the uh, poor quality of my PowerPoint presentation. Um, 
All, all I go. So the, the reason I wanted to present that talk or when Kevin asked me, do you want to present something? I said, well, why don't I present something about JEPCO? Because I, my memory is when when I started many years ago, arguably, uh, JEPCO was a bit of a of a what it is. Uh, is that a program? Is it an organization? Is it an institution? Is it a project? Is it a, uh, what, what is it just a group of friends or mates? What, what is it? So I just wanted to clarify a bit that hopefully over the last 10, 15 minutes. And what is the JEPCO guiding committee doing? What is its role? What is uh, its uh, structure and, and its uh, quote unquote its power? And then a couple of slides of uh, at the end, if I've got time, of what the future is looking like. Um, Oh, and great. Thanks for Jamie doing his, uh, in his talk who already presented uh, a little bit about JEPCO and he's done a very good job in uh, saying that JEPCO started in 1903. So first thing to notice is that JEPCO is uh, one probably and arguably the most, uh, the oldest research of science based, evidence based research program on uh, certainly on, um, on seafloor mapping. Uh, it was really thanks to that guy here, this photo there, Prince Albert Premier of um, of Monaco, uh, Albert the first, if you want, uh, who really had this vision, and then often those things are based on vision, who really had these visions of uh, the need for a proper um, seafloor map. And it really follows on the, the expeditions or the initiative that were all along the 19th century. And here I've, I've listed that one, the Challenger expedition, because that's probably the one that most people will know. The first chart that I show here, and incidentally, I saw the first chart, the real one in Monaco when I was there in uh, last April. And it's actually quite emotional when you've been working great part of your life on seafloor mapping and you see this, this chart on the paper. So here on the screen, it's only giving it a little bit of, uh, of credit. This, the first chart was um, made in 1903. Only take what, 10, 10 or nine months, I think, to, to make, probably because there was not that many um, soundings to use. And of course, all the sounding at that time were essentially exclusively wire soundings. Um, and then there were a certain number of what they call editions. So I jumped to the third edition straight away. The third edition was only in 1932. So the edition is when people think there is enough uh, information or an excess of information and a new edition is needed. And by the time of the third edition, of course, the echo sounding was coming back on board. The increase of data were perceived as huge, uh, which we see now as pretty small, but it was still perceived as huge. It was, there was still a large number of discrete wire soundings were include, but overall there was a, uh, the need for a new um, a new map and that's what happened here. This one again is the, the, the center of the Pacific and you can see that uh, you can see that it essentially follow transit. If you want to um, know more about JEPCO, I, I really do um, encourage you to read this book, which is available on the JEPCO website. It's called The History of JEPCO. It's a very uneasy read and some quite quite interesting story of where and how and, and who did what and how we came to where we are 100 years on. That was the 2003 and of course we've, we're already uh, almost uh, um, 20 years further away now. Then the fifth edition is the next one I want to talk about because that was really a great step. That was a step step change in uh, in JEPCO. First, a new governance was set up, and that's when the uh, the JEPCO guiding committee was set up. That is when IHO and uh, IOC joined, so the International Hydrographic Organizations and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commissions of UNESCO joined to um, uh, host uh, JEPCO. So that now JEPCO really is right under the auspices of IOC and IHO. The, the, the JEPCO guiding committee was set up as well with a you know, term of reference and rule of procedure and all the, 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 uh, the, 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 the administration that goes with those large and uh, international and intergovernmental organizations. The role really was to control, and I've listed four of the main one there, uh, of the two, uh, two first one, really to control the ge geomorphological details that were occurring from this increased uh, accuracy and um, resolution from, from the mapping, uh, and manage the increase of data volumes, uh, and also gather promote and gather and nurture this, this dynamic behind uh, um, seafloor mapping. That is also when the uh, US 
National Geophysical Data Center join in because the realizations that with the increase of that of volume of data, we needed to have some structure that were set up and the DCDB, the Data Center for Digital Bathymetry was well set up for that. And it continued to that day, of course, as I will go in my next slides or a few slides down. Uh, this fifth edition was only completed in 1982, so the first edition took nine months to uh, generate, and this one took uh, close to 10 years to generate. So, uh, increase of complexity, increase of amount of volume of data, etc. So, very, very brief history of what JECO is. Do read the uh, do read the history of JECO. That's quite an interesting read. But what is JEPCO today? Uh, the best organigram that I could come with was that one. So at the top, you can see that we, JEPCO is under the auspices of UNESCO and IHO. Um, and then you have all the organizations or groups of people or subcommittees of project or program or that are linked to JEPCO and that JEPCO really is trying to uh, um, coordinate and harmonize the, the runs, the, the, their runnings. The GGC here, I put it as a little bubble on the side because the GGC is role really, its role really is to supervise all this and make sure that Chipco is uh, doing its job. I want to go to the next slides about the, the those five sub technical subcommittee and in this gray, a lighter gray frame, I've also put the IHO DCDB because it's really integratively part of JEPCO and of course the CBET 2030 program, which not technically a, a subcommittee is integrative of JEPCO and uh, is one of, uh, of a flagship, if you want, as uh, Jamie put it, uh, one of the flagship of JEPCO. Um, and, and 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 of course, I put the Nippon Foundation because we've got a very strong link with the Nippon Foundation. I'll come back to that when I've got uh, when we talk about the uh, the CBET 2030, but also when we talk about the training uh, program. So the first, I'm not going to have a slide for each of the technical uh, uh, subcommittee because otherwise my talk would be a bit boring, a bit too long. But I put four of them, which I think are, are quite um, uh, active and important to mention now. So first one is TSCOM is a technical subcommittee on ocean mapping. So TSCOM really is, as its name says, it's really to advise the JEPCO community and the GGC in part, but the JEPCO community uh, in the building and use of the JEPCO product. So it's really looking at emerging technologies. It's looking at disseminating the data, contributing to the dissemination of data, and also it's got a subgroup. So it's a subgroup of the subcommittee uh, working on the uh, on the metadata. One thing that in the CBET 2030 you will be very very well aware of. It used to oversee the JEPCO cookbook, but my understanding is that the cookbook now is, a, is a sort of a uh, stopped initiatives. The chair is George Spoltra. With, um, uh, is, uh, and his role, of course, is to animate and to coordinate the activity of the committee. But there's about uh, a group of 10 or 15 people, I don't know, uh, who are meeting irregularly, I should say, but are working toward those, those various initiatives. Scrum uh, is a subcommittee on regional and undersea mapping and um, is run by Aline Bowen based in Ireland. Uh, this is really looking at facilitating the collaboration with regional mapping effort. So it's really very, a very strong link with CBET 2030. It's really encouraging incorporation of compilation into the JEPCO, uh, and it's made out of membership of 17 people. I suspect that actually far more people do contribute to Scrum, but those 17 people are the, the guts of the of the group that uh, generate the activity. In 21-22, uh, obviously they were very uh, involved with the JEPCO and they contributed to the JEPCO grid review with the web app uh, and they generated new uh, YouTube content about Africa and Atlantic in collaboration with SCOPE, the subcommittee for outreach. Uh, and they also developed the IOC State of the Ocean report, so quite a big, big type of work. They, they do have their own web page, so do, do go there. And, and I really encourage you, if you have something specific to those subcommittees, to liaise and contact their chair. So that's what I've put their, their email here, and I'm sure they won't mind me doing so. Kevin is probably the one that will be worth a full 15-minute uh, presentation on its own, and Kevin is part of the Kevin, so he probably knows far more than me. But Kevin is possibly one of the, the most 
powerful by lack of a better word, but the most influential rather uh, subcommittee of JEPCO. It's got now a very strong role uh, internationally, it's very well recognized internationally at uh, generating uh, uniformizations and uniform the policy for the handling of geographical name and the standardization of those undersea feature names. As you are well aware, most of you, uh, naming an undersea feature is not such, uh, it's not that easy. It used to be, you could give, uh, you know, when I, when I started um, a few years back, I won't tell you how many, a few years back, it was just easy. You would discover, literally discover Simon and you you could argue that you, you were the discoverer and you would give it uh, we will give that uh, future the name you wanted. Well, how, luckily now we need to standardize that and have some agreement of and some rules and some pro rule of procedures of how to do that so that people agree and that the name are recognized for prosperity and for my uh, human kind, so to speak. So the, the SCUFN really go through quite a number of a very uh, important uh, initiatives. First, they look the overlook after the JEPCO Gazetteer of undersea feature names. So once this name are accepted, they consider and decide on the names that have been submitted to the subcommittee. And every year they meet and they go through a, a painstaking exercise of looking at the criteria, looking at the data that have been provided by, by the countries and the rationales behind uh, giving the name. So it's, it's, it's actually um, a very important role of uh, SCUFN and in which SHIPCO is very proud to support and encourage and nurture. And you can go again through their website and you can, uh, each country can propose a name, but you can also look at the official names that have been uh, accepted uh, through their website. You can look for, it's, it's actually quite a, a nice uh, website to play with. There's no, no no message behind the one I picked up. I literally picked up the first uh, slide uh, geography area that uh, came up when I connected on SCUF on the website last week when I prepared my talk. The scope is really about, uh, as the name is said, but it's on its own, the uh, communication, outreach, and public engagement. I've just uh, couldn't find any really specific image rather than I put either. Uh, the website of the JEPCO itself, because they look after the website, or just a photo of its chair, Timothy here, here on the top right, and, uh, and a few others members of the committee here. And really, the, the, the role is is, uh, is it's easy to list, but it's not easy to do. Uh, it's uh, looking after the the outreach, the publicity, foster the coordinations. Uh, their role really is to herd. The, the best analogy or metaphor would be the herding cat analogy. And I, I won't say no more because they're doing a great work and it's uh, often possibly overlooked uh, at, the, um, at what they're doing and the complexity of what they're trying to do with so little um, resources as well. We really at JEPCO, as, as CBET 2030 does as well, rely on the technology and the expertise and quality of work of the IHO DCDB based in, um, at NOAA in, in, in the US. Uh, they now host more than 30 terabyte of oceanic soundings acquired over the years through any hydrographic oceanographic uh, or, or other type of, uh, of methods. They also uh, overlook at the production of the bathymetric map and, and the grid and make the grid available for JEPCO on their website. So uh, probably in a transparent way and that's something that Kevin will explain better than me. But uh, overall, um, the role of RFC, uh, this IHO DCDB is really important and not to be underestimated in how JEPCO functions and can deliver what it's meant to deliver to, uh, to the hydrographic uh, seafloor mapping community and, and the community at large. And uh, probably toward the end, the JEPCO trading program, and I saw that Rochelle was actually, I saw Rochelle was on the, on the, on the list of, uh, of people listening here, so I better be careful what I'm saying. Um, but it's very hard to see anything uh, more Less negative, less, well, very positive. It's an incredibly positive program. It's been going for 18 years, and as you can see, we had 107 scholars, and Haya is one of them, and uh, Haruka was one of them. We talked a bit before that. I had the pleasure to have her at Niwa when I was there. Uh, there's quite a few of those scholars that will be listening. Uh, listening today, I saw Hugo, I think, Montero as well uh, as a scholar. So. The, the training goes, is funded by the Nippon Foundation once again, uh, and it's based at the University of New Hampshire and deliver in 12 months a postgraduate certificate in ocean spathymetry. 
It is run by Rochelle, uh, who is looking after all those guys every year, year on, year after, year in, uh, doing a great job. And uh, many of the Jelko Scola do end up um, helping, most of them do end up uh, helping one way or another to, into Jelko or the CBET 2030 or both, uh, the CBET 2030. I've, uh, I won't read it here, but you've got an example of the training, it's quite a complete training. I mean, the top, top uh, expert hydrographer and uh, oceanographer and scientist teaching and providing the courses in the Hampshire University. So, um, uh, something that we need, we are pretty also very proud to support. And very quickly, what next? So that's last month or two months ago in April, I was uh, in Monaco for the 38 um, CHIP co guiding committee meeting. That, that was the first one post COVID. Uh, and that was my first one, and that was the first one of the new JEPCO guiding committee, which was almost uh, not completely renewed, but we had a new chair, and we had two or three new members. And so, of course, like every time you've got a new uh, committee that jump in, they think they're going to jump the world and do everything better than anyone else before. And so we started a governance review because we're aware that JEPCO is now moving into the 20, well, into well, well into the 21st century. And for my sins, why did I travel to Monaco? I'm not sure, but I was given the task of developing the strategy for JEPCO because uh, we realized, I mean, we knew that, but uh, we sort of put on the table, uh, but JEPCO doesn't even have a strategy. So you have a strategy for IOC, you've got a strategy for IHO, CBET 20 has got a strategy. Some of the subcommittee have got their own strategy. And the Nippon Foundation certainly had a strategy, but JEPCO, which is supposed to bring those together into something tangible and uh, um, coherent uh, and dynamic, hasn't got a strategy. So I was given the task to develop this strategy. No need to say that uh, it's, uh, it's so easy that I've written it in the plan on my way back. Not. Um, we've also talked about the issue of including crowd, crowd bathymetry. That's something that, of course, the DCDB is doing uh, actively. That's something that CBET 2030 is considering at many levels. Uh, we also talk, but that's the thing that's a bit later on, uh, of idea like including the backscatter data in, uh, in JEPCO a bit more in a more efficient and open way, including modeling, etc. So a lot of discussions, a lot of uh, as open, you've got four days of discussion. This is really good, especially post-COVID. Uh, but overall, the two big one will be the governance review and the JEPCO strategy review. We also went through a, a, a SWOT analysis. Um, you can see that there's, there's nothing out, uh, out of the extraordinary, out of the ordinary through those strengths, weaknesses and opportunity and threats. But it's always interesting to look at them. So, and that's this. I really copied it from the minutes of this meeting. So globally, uh, the fundraising, of course, for Chipco is an issue. We 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 literally are all of the people uh, from the GGC um, are um, voluntary people. We do that outside our main area of work. Uh, it does take the amount of work you want to put in. So, and uh, when you are take initiative like developing a strategy or reviewing the governance, you have to put the effort into it. So we also are well aware that we need to do some fundraising at some stage. It's been talked about many times. Um, there was a significant amount of, of thinking about it. And hopefully you will hear more, a bit more about that over the next uh, couple or two or three years when the GGC gets up and going uh, as it should be. All, what is JEPCO? Because that was the title of my talk. What is JEPCO? Well, JEPCO is a program, it's a product, and it's also the people. Uh, so really, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of three in one, a trilogy of program, people, and product. And I've re put here because normally I would start the talk by saying JEPCO's aim is to provide the most authoritative publicly available bathymetry in the world ocean. And I wanted to finish by that because this is what we're going to try to review through our strategy. Can we? This was what was given by uh, Hans uh, Albert first in 1903. Maybe 220 years later, it's time to move toward these visions and do something that still can still follow its vision and its will, but moves into the more um, 21st century. Thank you.
Merci beaucoup, Geoffroy. De rien. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions for Critical for Geoffroy? Uh, if not, I think we'll move straight into a coffee break. Um, if we could start, and it's going to be a short coffee break, can we um, come back here at half past the hour uh, and we'll get into the next talk from uh, Dr. Patrick Collin from um, Palau. So coffee break now, everybody. And I'll see you back here at, at half past the hour. <laughs>